I thought I should speak from my heart to your heart. So rather than give you a lecture, I will speak, I will, I will just throw out some few things out there and I want us just to engage. Um, so that is the format. So please feel free to interrupt me at any given moment if you have any thoughts. Uh, I will speak maybe for about 10, 15 minutes and then we can have a chat, we can communicate, we could. I actually want to thank so much Mary, before I forget, Mary, um, the person that had the initiative and the vision to start Frontline Defenders. I don't know if she's around. Yeah. Mary. <laughs> It is on shoulders like you, we, we sit and we stand so that we can shine, Mary. This is visionary, and I also actually want to pay tribute to human rights defenders across the globe. Those ones that died working as human frontline human rights defenders, and those that are still on the field. Some have been arrested and released. I want to pay tribute to them this evening. Okay, so I come from this beautiful country called Nigeria. We are about 200 million people in the country. And it's sharply divided between the north and the south and the east. And so my work um, started first as a, as a prosecutor. Before I became a prosecutor, I worked briefly as an investigative police officer in the Bureau for Investigation and Intelligence. Now I'm saying this because it builds up later to what I, I, start, I, I, I did in life. I accidentally became educated. I accidentally became a lawyer. At the age of 10, I was given out a marriage. Uh, when I became a lawyer, I accidentally went to Harvard to teach. And a lot of what had happened to me has been an accident. And we can talk about that uh, if you want in a Q&A. Fast forward. I left Ministry of Justice where I was a prosecutor for eight years and I started uh, a legal clinic for women and children in 1996. I had no clients for two years. This is because I am a woman. And will that be something to slow somebody down? No. So you have a creative way of getting out of what a space that somebody wants to put you and just jump out and do something. So this legal clinic for women and children exposed me to so much over time. And in 1999, the Nigerian government introduced the Islamic Sharia. And they were looking for female from the north to come on board. Not many came on board. I, somebody described me as if they see fire, people run away. When I see fire, I run into the fire. And that's what I did. When people were not ready to take the cases, I said, I would try. I would try. And of course, I was baptized with fire as, as it go, went on. And it was an experience that was humbling. Fast forward in 2014, the Boko Haram kidnapped some children, some young girls between the ages of 11 and 14. And I was still teaching at Harvard. So the president of Nigeria asked that I come back to Nigeria to help with the rescue effort. And I came back for that purpose, to work with the Boko Haram team under the presidency. That was 2014. In 2015, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Hassan of Jordan invited me to Jordan. And in that experience, which was more focused on women empowerment and the interpretation of Sharia, to try to see how the judges would understand a bit of my book, which he read online. I, I was able to understand the refugee crisis, but more about the refugee in, in the biggest camp, uh, about a million people in um, Zatari, in Jordan, I began to understand the ISIS. I met some of the mothers, I met some of the members of ISIS, just like I have met Boko Haram in Nigeria. And I sat back and I said, hmm, in the work I have done with Boko Haram, so on one hand, on 2015, I was in the Middle East, understanding a little bit of Daesh, they call it, or ISIS. On the other hand, I had done some work with Boko Haram. And in my work with Boko Haram, I had, I will share with you a story of a mother and a son. 
Now, when I was invited in, I had an independence because I didn't lobby to come in. I was just asked to come in, and I said, okay, I will take, take my independence seriously. If they don't want what I'm contributing, I'm happy to leave. So independence is important as I work, especially people that are into human rights defend the front line of that and what we do. And independence gives us some certain leverages in what we do. So I went to the chairman, trying to see how he can allow me to visit the prison. It wasn't our time of reference, so he wouldn't allow. Uh, subsequently, I pushed myself a little bit more, and then he allowed me to visit the Boko Haram in prison in my degree. We visited with them, had chat, and I wanted to go one step further. I wanted to meet the mothers. I asked for the first information report, which is the file of the young men between the ages of 15 and 25. Got the file, read them, tried to trace their background. Fast forward, I was able to meet with the mothers. Now the next step was what do I do with this? But I wanted to see if the, the mothers thought the children are dead. The children told the mothers don't care, maybe because of their this group of Boko Haram. So we decided that we are going to bring the children and the mothers were going to be in the prison. So we took the mothers into the prison. One by one we wanted to try our luck so that we don't have any misfortune. In our culture, a young man does not embrace his mother. We don't do that. At some certain age, you become a man, so you don't hug your mother. So we came and sat on the mat, the men were sitting on the chairs. And the young man came just from the door there where the young lady is to like my podium, and he saw his mother, and he started running run and came on, just fell on his mother and hugged the mother. Now remember, those young men have been in detention for more than two years. They have been tortured. You can imagine any imaginable torture somebody could have. They have been tortured. They didn't get information from them. So the mother just asked three words in Hausa, which is the local language, me yafaru. In translation in English, what went so wrong? And the boys, the, the young man, t -t 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 just started chatting, telling the mother everything. And of course, the security agent that I would ask just grab their radio and whatever, t whatever they wanted to use to record, started recording. This is an information that not, was not solicited for, was there was no torture that gave them that information. So it all down to me that there is a softer power. It's not the power of the Apache helicopters. It's not the power of the drones or the AK-47. It's not the power of the military hardware, but it's a softer power in the mothers. And of course, that is where part of Mothers Without Borders came about. What can mothers do across region? And then I skip over to Jordan, where the mothers of the ISIS have gone far beyond what we have been trying to do with the Boko Haram. They are identifying red flags when their children are either about to go in or they are out. They do not discard or say, no, they are bad children, they are Boko Haram, they are, they are ISIS, they are killers. No, no, no. They are the children of our womb. We give back to them. They are just our children. And we will not allow them to be cast away. We will embrace them and see what change we can help happen with them. And so that pushed me one, one step forward. So in 2016, last year, I had an exploratory meeting at Harvard, July. And I brought mothers from 11 countries. And we were trying to juxtapose some of these issues of extremism and here, for the students that are here, I would, I, I would be a little bit more academic. So I would drop some few lines of uh, uh, some thoughts that I thought could be helpful. So why do youth join Boko Haram or ISIS? Why do young men and women sometimes do that? The first take is that they are very creative. 
they want to ventilate their creativity. They are very curious. They have a twisted interpretation and translation of texts. There are majors, there are maybe 4,000 school of thinking in Islam. There are four major school of thinking. Either you are Shia or Sunni, Ahmadiyya, Tijaniya. They have a twisted understanding and interpretation of text, both the Quran and the Hadith. They have been indoctrinated for the most part in the mocks, for the most part in the chat room when they were not caught. They have a chat room that is disguised with codes. Social media is a massive recruiter of them. And I will post and say here that the media could be the oxygen of a terrorist. And when the media become an oxygen of a terrorist, we all become endangered as a result of that. Let me also move to one or two other issues I want to mention. The first one is foreign policy, and we can talk about it in Q&A if you want to. There's a lot of issue of demo demography. Now we have a lot of refugee in your countries, uh, especially the one coming from Syria as a result of running away from their difficulties of ISIS. We have issues of globalization. We have a bit of transitional policies and modernization. Some of the youth we work with in the Netherlands and in Brussels that have come in from, their parents came in to the West from North Africa. Some of them are, don't know who they are. So identity become an issue. And they have no root. Are they Algerians? Are they Netherlanders? They have no root. So that has confused them from inside some of them that have lost it have joined. There's deprivation. We talk about a lot about poverty and lack of job. With the Boko Haram, about 70% of people, young men in the northern part of Nigeria, do not have job. They finish university and colleges, so they become a breeding ground for recruitment. So these are some of the things that I found on the field. What are their motivations? They are, they are upset, they are angry, there's a lot of grievances. There is an ideology that is taking root, some of them without more. A lot of brainwashing, as a result of teaching in the, in the mocks. There are issues of politics and policy. Some of the uh, explanation of Boko Haram was that when the politician wanted uh, boys to be their foot soldiers, they recruited them. When they get the power, they let them go. And they couldn't satisfy them anymore, so they turned around and became uh, partly Boko Haram. I mentioned poverty. And there, in part of the Middle East, I found that revenge, revenge has formed part of so why some of them entered into Daesh or into ISIS. They have nothing to lose as a result of politics and policies in some of their region. They have lost their parents, they have lost their beloved ones. So nothing to lose than to stripe themselves with bomb and kill themselves and kill others. Nothing to lose. In some instances, they want to make a point. And I wanted to mention for the sake of the student here, the four Ps that international community has sort of zeroed down into focusing in a global sense. How do we persuade them? How do you prevent them? How do you prepare us and prepare against them? And how do we protect us? And they call it the four Ps. So these are some of the four Ps that has been juxtaposed uh, in the international community. I mentioned the facilitation as a social media, as a big facilitant, and weapons, where weapons are freely given. We trace some of the Boko Haram weapons to Libya. 
and then you trace, 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 trace Libya to the United States, because a lot of them that were about 60, 70 percent uh, emanated in that route, and they came through Chad and Niger and Cameroon into the northern Nigeria. So they have arms at will. They can shoot at will. In fact, some of their arms, they are more armed than the Nigerian police or Nigerian army. So as some of this facilitate, they are moving forward and may be more dangerous. But what can we do as mothers? Uh, I will also mention some few things and I will jump and conclude. I think we, we have the power from inside to make difference happen. Nobody knows a child like his mother. Nobody. Sit down and think the men. Nobody may know you like your mother. And so how do we use the soft power from inside, from within, to make change happen? And we can discuss details. I mentioned issues of language. We can reinforce positive language. I have two young boys, 13 and 19, 14 and 19. And they, they, have, they have grown up to be interesting young men. My older one became a champion in Massachusetts in wrestling and New England and became the Boston Globe Sportman of the Year. And I remember I would tell him, if you do one small thing, I'll blow it out of proportion. I actually, the more he get medals, the more I, I will frame the medals. Even if it is a useless medal, I will frame it. And I made a hall of fame for him. So how do we reinforce positivity the little we see and how can we keep reinforcing it and how can we exchange that among us to make us strong irrespective of lack of our languages between Arabic and Hausa. We have something common that we can unite around which is the power of our children to make them better citizens. There's a bond in Islam between a mother and a, and a son and it's an Islamic text which, we, which I, I use a lot in uh, the Arabic countries I have been to. Uh, even in the northern Nigeria, where we are mostly Muslims, uh, one of the disciples came to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, and he said to him, who should I honor? The Prophet told him, your mother. He went back second time, your mother. Third time, your mother. It is only the fourth time that say your father. And that has root in a lot of Islamic communities. And we use it well because it has because it has root. We try to, you know, dust it and use it as much, and that that is a very helpful text for us to use as mothers to, to introduce uh, our children to from youth. We have a lot of instinct. We have intuition. We we can be game changers. We should never take anything for granted. If there is one take home that I want to leave here, is that do not sleep with somebody's eyes. Don't pretend to sleep with somebody's eyes. It doesn't work. So as I move from place to place, it becomes more real to me that everything is contextual, that there is not one single silver bullet to sort out the difficulties of terrorism. But understanding that I can sleep with my own eyes and work within my context and work from within every given context helps me to move forward day in, day out. And I wake up, in conclusion, I say to myself, I don't want to change the world. I'm not sure we can do that as much, but we can play our part. One person, one day, one issue, one time, the world is a better place because of each of us here, and I thank you for listening.